Amen. And amen. And thank God that He is. Or else we'd be in a lot of trouble. Thank God that He is good and that He loves. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Summer is here. School's closing out. BBS is upon us. Decorations are already being made. It happens not this week, but next week. Decorations are going up this week. So you get here next Sunday, this will look like a different place. But I want to let you know, before we get started today, that all those people that need to come to BBS, they won't come unless they know about it. And so we're trying to do something This week, as schools, the elementary schools in our area are finishing out, we're trying to get some people together to meet on a few mornings and pass out these cars. Just stick them in windshields of of cars that are parking. The parents there for the final activities of the day and target these people to say, we've got something for your children that's good. It's something where they're going to find out about this love that God has for us. They're going to find out how special they are in God's eyes and who He is. And the values that He has and to to learn those and to practice those to honor Him. So we want to pass out these cards to, to those people. If you can help, we need your help. It'll only take about 30 minutes on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of this month. Always about 9 o'clock in the morning. We're on the... Later in the summer, we're doing a parenting seminar. We want to let these people know, too, that there is a seminar that just deals with parenting. It's not, a, it's not a whole weekend. It's just a Friday evening to talk about anger and bad attitudes in children and their parents. So we're, we're bringing somebody in to help us with that. We want to advertise that. But we need your help to get the word out. We have these cards out in the foyer. You can take and pass out to your friends. But we need some help this week. This is a schedule of the times that we're going to be passing out. We're just going to meet at these schools and pass out these cards to the people as they're coming. Stick them in windshields. And this schedule is printed on a flyer, a little piece of paper out here next to these cards out on the table. Pick one of those up. Meet us at the school. Let us know you're coming so we know how many to expect. Meet us at the school and help us pass these cards out. Take about 30 minutes for those days. I know you can't hardly read that. So pick up one of the sheets out in the foyer and help us get that word out. It's a great time that God has planned for us. Have you ever had a chance of a lifetime and you missed it? Did you know you missed it when you missed it? Did you, do you remember thinking back, oh, if I could have just done this? How many of you, if you could go back and redo something in your life, you would do it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like this. Can I, can I redo uh, several things? Can I change a lot? <clears throat> How many of you would have invested differently if you would have known what you know today? Wouldn't that be great? What was it? Back to the future. He got the sports almanac and became a rich man. If you knew what was going to happen in the future, you could make great decisions today, couldn't you? problem is we don't know what's going to happen in the future. I want to show you a, a, a man who wishes he knew what was going to happen in the future. This man is famous. Do you recognize him? Somebody must. Okay, let me help you out. His name is Ronald Wayne. Now you got to remember him? He is famous in this country. Okay, see if this jogs your memory at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, now you remember Ronald Wayne, don't you? 
No. Everybody knows this symbol. He had a lot to do with this symbol. He said, oh, oh, oh. He's the guy who invented this symbol, right? No, no, that's not what he's famous for. You know, before Apple had this symbol, they had this one. But Ronald Wayne didn't have anything to do with this one. Do you remember what they had before this one? The logo they had before? The rainbow apple. That's right. The rainbow apple was on everything. It was a, was the symbol of Apple computers for so many years. But Ronald Wayne had nothing to do with that one either. But there was another logo that Apple Computer had before this one. And this one not many people recognize. See if you recognize this one. Does that look familiar? This was the logo that Ronald Wayne put together for Apple Computer. That was their first logo. That's a picture of Sir Isaac Newton sitting under the apple tree. The apple's about ready to fall on his head, which they say, the story goes, sparks his delving into the, the laws of physics and gravity and so forth that opens so many doors for, phys, uh, what do you call it? They're not physicians, but physics professors and so forth today. And so there he is sitting under the apple tree, apple computer. Ronald Wayne made this logo, but Ronald Wayne was one of three guys who started Apple Computer. There were three guys. You probably are familiar with, with these first two. You know Steve Jobs. We know his name. Most of you probably know Steve Wozniak. Steve Wozniak actually was the one who built the computer. Steve was kind of the, the business creative genius behind it. Steve Wozniak built the computer. But Ronald Wayne was the third partner in the team. Ronald was an engineer. He was a, uh, a businessman. And he was part of the, the team that started Apple Computer. When they founded the company and they went into this partnership, Steve Jobs got 45% of the company. Steve Wozniak got 45% of the company. And then Ronald Wayne was a, more of a minor partner. He just got 10%. His job there was to kind of be a tiebreaker. When Steve and Steve, who were just kind of wild men, when they would get into their battles, Ronald Wayne came in to be the tiebreaker. The problem was, Ronald Wayne was a fairly wealthy man. He had more money than either of these two guys. And so he got a little scared working with these two guys because they were unpredictable. You didn't know what they were going to do, and they might do something that would get them sued, and he would lose his wealth. They didn't have as much to lose. He did. And he had had some bad business experiences before, and so he knew that business could go bad. And so this was all, all kind of scary. So two weeks after he received 10% of Apple Computer, he sold all of his shares for $800. 10% of Apple Computer. Today, those shares would be worth over $35 billion if he had held on to those shares. You think, oh, what was I thinking? What could I do? Why didn't I hold on to that if I could just go back and redo this? However, it's interesting. Ronald Wayne, he's living in a little town out in Nevada. He's not a wealthy man. He said he could have been a wealthy man, but he doesn't have any regrets. Because he did what he thought was best at the time. These two guys were lunatics. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, they were breaking ground. They were walking places nobody had ever gone before. And it was scary. Wayne, Ronald Wayne, had something to lose. And so to protect his wealth, 
He backed out of Apple Computer and sold his shares for $800 to protect what he had, not knowing what was going to happen in the future, but being afraid of what could happen. And we look at Ronald Wayne, we think, oh, if you had just held on, if you had just had some faith, if you had just had some, you know, a, a little bit of, of enthusiasm to, to go forward with this and take a risk, you could have been so wealthy. He did say, too, that, that these guys were kind of maniacs. They were running so fast. He would have been a wealthy man, but he would have been a wealthy man in a cemetery. He couldn't keep up with them. They would have killed him. But... We think back and think there was a chance of a lifetime. You were stepping into something that nobody could ever even dream of and let it go. But you know what? I'm afraid that we're a little bit like that today, too. We're a little bit like that even with Jesus. Because Jesus gives us a chance. He gives us a chance of a lifetime. He gives us some things that that we can't even imagine, and yet we, we calculate our risks, and we calculate what we have to lose, and we calculate you know, what it might cost us in this moment and in the road down, down the road, and sometimes we just say, thank you, Jesus, but we back off a little bit, don't we? It's a little hard sometimes to jump into things with both feet not exactly knowing where they're going. And sometimes we want to protect what we have. Maybe we want to protect our reputation. Maybe we want to protect our wealth. Maybe we want to protect our time. Maybe we want to protect our, our privacy. Who knows? But sometimes we get a little bit protective about what we have and what we are, and we don't like to change. I like my routine, and I am so guilty of this. I like my routine. I'm comfortable in it. And to step out and do some things that are challenging aren't always what I want to do. And yet, sometimes it's what I very much need to do. I want to share with you a story today. You can open your Bibles up to Luke chapter 4. I want to share with you the story of some people who were given the chance of a lifetime. Some of them accepted the chance. Some of them didn't. I want to see if we can find ourselves in that story. Look at yourself. See where you can put your name in this story. Which camp... Which part of this story do you belong to? This is Luke chapter 4. We're going to be starting in chapter, in verse 14. So follow along with me in this story. Jesus. Now at this point, Jesus had just he'd been baptized. He'd gone into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. He was tempted by Satan. And then he came back and he started his public ministry. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. <clears throat> he was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. And then he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. And what it said was, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And you can just see this moment. He sits down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's a pretty bold claim, isn't it? Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The one God said He anointed and sent to do all this is here. And Luke records says, All spoke well of Him. They were amazed at the gracious words that came from His lips. But, 
Some of them ask, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Isn't this Joseph's son? Slow down a minute. Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this that kid that we watched grow up right here in Nazareth? Isn't this the kid who followed his dad around, the carpenter? Wait a minute. Before we get all too fired up and too anxious to jump into some crazy thing, before we jump on this bandwagon, let's, let's be real here. We know this kid. He grew up right here. We know he, he's not a savior. He's not a messiah. This is Joseph's kid. Mark records this situation. He doesn't even say it's Joseph's kid. He says that the people said, no, this is Mary's child. You remember that illegitimate child? Remember the one that she got pregnant before they got married? You remember that? That's this guy. Savior, Messiah, anointed one, sent from God? I don't think so. And you see what they missed? chance of a lifetime that Jesus was right there in their presence. They could touch him. They could talk with him. They could ask him questions. They could, he was healing people. He was raising people from the dead. He was doing all kinds of things. They had him right there in their presence. And they let him go. Not only let him go, they rejected him. And Jesus said, he talked to him some more. He said, okay, you say this about me. I'm just Joseph's son. And I tell you the truth, no prophet has any honor in his hometown. And that's very much true today. It's hard to come back to your own family, isn't it? It's hard to come back to the people who know you the most and to tell them something new. And they go, say, come on, I know you, I've watched you, I wiped your nose and everything else. I know, don't tell me the story. I know what you've been through. I know. It's hard sometimes to go back to the people who know you the best. And Jesus went back to Nazareth. And they said, we, Don't tell us any fancy stories, Jesus. We know who you are. Do we ever do that today? Do we ever hear something that might seem different than what we're used to? And we discount it because it's different. I already know the truth. I already know what I want to do. I already know what's best. I already... No. I was shocked one day to have a Bible study with a, with a woman who, who was having trouble understanding something the church was doing. And, and then the elder sat down with her and said, let's go and let's really look and see what the Bible says about this. And she said, I can't believe we have to go back to the Bible and study something I already know. And she rejected, not knowing, not knowingly, but she rejected the truth of the word because she already thought she knew it. And these people rejected Jesus because they thought they already knew him. And so their response to Jesus, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard Jesus and they got up and they drove him out of town and they took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. They were going to kill him. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. I, I want to see that scene. How did he do that? I don't know. But something caught the people's attention and they, they were stopped right at the brow of the hill, right at the edge of the cliff where they're going to throw him off. And he just walked through the crowd. And who was left empty-handed? Those people who have been given such a chance. And I look at I got to look at this story and I see where is my name in that story? Where do I fit in that story? Am I the one who rejects him, or am I the one saying, "Wait, wait, wait, wait"? Before we jump to conclusions, let's consider this. We've all been waiting for a Messiah. We've been waiting for a Savior. God promised one. He's got to come from someplace, doesn't he? Why not Nazareth? How many of you about... Okay. Confession time. How many of you bought a lottery ticket? 
Yeah? Why? Somebody's got to win, right? Somebody's got to win. If the Messiah has to come from some town, who's to say it's not Nazareth? Would, I, would that be my voice? Or would my voice be going, don't give me this stuff, Jesus. I watched you grow up. I sat next to you in school. You goody, goody little guy. I mean, come on. I don't know what he was like growing up. I knew he studied hard because by the time he was 12, he already knew the scriptures so well that he confounded the priests in Jerusalem. So obviously he was a good student. He invested himself. He worked hard. But I don't know what he was like growing up, but those people did. Would I be just like one of them? I've got to ask myself that. Put ourselves in these stories. We've been given a chance of a lifetime. What do we do with it? There are a lot of reasons that the people might have rejected Jesus. But he left that crowd. He walked through them. And he went to a place called Capernaum. Down at the Sea of Galilee on the northern edge of it. And he taught the people in Capernaum. And they loved him. He healed people. And they came and they listened. They hung on every word he said. And they followed him around. And it was a great place. Jesus was loved there. He was a rock star in Capernaum. Everybody was coming to see him. Everybody was coming to listen to his words. And then he had a choice to make. Starting in Luke chapter 5, he was standing by the lake of Gesenaret, the Sea of Galilee. And the people there near Capernaum, they were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen. The fishermen were washing their nets. And he got into the one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Jesus had made a decision not to stay in that town of Capernaum where it was safe. He said, I've got to go. They were clamoring for him to stay, but he said, I've got to go and preach the word. Sent on a mission from God. And so he went down the shore. He went down the coastline to teach to other people. And they followed him. And everywhere he went, they followed him. And they were crowding on him up to the seashore. And so he looked down and he saw these two little boats sitting down there. He got on one. They went out into the water a little bit so he could be free to talk to them. So he talks to them. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, who owned the boat, he said, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now Simon had a choice to make. He had heard Jesus teaching. I mean, Jesus was sitting right there in his boat. He had heard the stories about Jesus. But he would also had been out all night fishing. And then they came in, and after you fish, you have to take care of your nets. They have been cleaning nets all day, all morning. Cleaning nets while Jesus is talking. They're getting the nets spread out there to dry. And Jesus says, okay, boys, let's throw them overboard again. Wait a minute, Jesus. You grew up as a, what, carpenter, right? What do you know about fishing? I'm a commercial fisherman. I am a professional fisherman. I know about fish. And we have been working hard all night when the fish are at the surface. And now they've gone deep. It's daytime. The sun is out. The fish are not here. Could you see him making this argument? Couldn't you see these things going through his head? Jesus, we've worked hard. But tell me this. What do you think Jesus knows? How, how smart do you think Jesus is? That's an important question I have to answer because it, it, it makes a difference in how I respond. It makes a difference in whether I trust him or not. Simon make a choice right here. He had to choose to trust him or not. They had worked hard. It was time for them to go home. Their work night, day was over. 
They're working the, the, the night shift. And now it was noon, and they're ready to go home and take a break. And Jesus says, let's go do this for fun. <laughs> well, he makes a choice, and he obeys. Jesus isn't a fisherman, but there's something about him. And Peter trusts him. He says, that when they'd done, gone out, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Is that what that says? I think it's my second set of eyes. When they had done so, they caught such a great catch of fish that their nets began to break. And so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Now, this was a miracle, obviously. Because Simon knew that the fish go deep during the sun, the heat of the day. They're not sitting there at the surface where their nets can grab them. And so he sees a miracle. Now, Peter's response is unexpected. What would you expect his response to be? Wow! This is amazing! You, you are my best bud. <laughs> you come fishing with me every day, okay? He was a commercial fisherman. This was the catch of his life. He had probably lay the night in bed dreaming about the day I could fill my boat with fish. But now he's not only filling his boat, he's filling his partner's boat too. They're both filled to the point of sinking. And here's what Simon does. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell. He fell at Jesus' feet. And he said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Go away from me. For I am a sinful man. Something dawned in Peter's life. And now he is being presented a choice of a lifetime. A chance of a lifetime. What do you do with this? We see immediately he's scared to death. Jesus is sitting in his boat. Jesus has done something amazing. Jesus has done something he can't explain. Except he knows that this is the man of God. Because nobody can make fish jump in a net like that. Nobody can haul in a, a load of fish even at night like that, much less during the heat of the day. This man, if he knows fishing, what does he know about me? What does he know about my life? And am I willing to hang with somebody who knows me so well? That's a little scary. Because I know my life is not good. I know my life is not perfect. It's far from perfect. I know my life is sinful. I know my life, and I'm not sure I want to stand in the light of some guy who can make fish jump into the net in the middle of a day. And so he says, go away from me. But do you remember how Jesus responds to him? He says this to Simon. Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore and left everything and followed him. Don't be afraid. Ronald Wayne was afraid. He was afraid of what these two crazy men were going to do and to protect himself he withdrew from Apple computer and sold all of his shares for $800 and now he lives playing penny slots in a little desert town in Nevada Jesus calls us he says I want you to follow me I want you to lay down your life I want you to pick up your cross daily I want you to deny yourself and follow me. Do what I do. Be my voice. Be my hands. Be my 
attitude, be my heart, be my feet, be me to the people. I'm calling you to be like me and do what I do. Is that scary? Yeah, and Jesus says, don't be afraid. He's giving us a chance of a lifetime to follow Him, to make a difference in this world. But we're only 300 people. What can we do? We're just a little drop in just as valley much as the world. What can we do? And me, myself, who am I 